To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Yes, Lord, there is none who is your equal, none, God, Lord, who compares with you. Lord, we declare today, Lord, that the Lord is the everlasting God, Amen. the creator of the ends of the earth. And Lord, we are gathered here this morning to praise you and to worship you, O God. So Lord, as we bring our offering of worship, adoration, Lord, to exalt you, Lord, may you take delight and be pleased, O God, Lord, with all that we give to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on His name. Make known among the nations what He has done and proclaim that His name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for He has done great things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion. For great, great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Hallelujah. Let's rejoice. Let's proclaim His greatness this morning. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He reigns. Oh, put your heads together. Oh, creation cries. Oh, creation cries to you. Worshipping in spirit and in truth. Glory to the faithful one, Jesus Christ our Son. All creation gives you praise. All creation gives you praise. For you alone are truly great. God is great. God is great, and His grace fills the earth, fills the heavens, and Your name will be praised through all the world. God is great, sing His grace, all the earth, all the heavens, must we live for the glory. His 
praise fills the earth, fills the heavens, and your name will be praised to all the world. God is great, sing his praise, all the earth, all the heavens.
Father, this morning we want to proclaim your name, oh Father. We want to speak your name into every situation right now. In every circumstance, Lord, we speak Jesus. We speak the name above all names, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. In, in places where there's darkness, Lord, in places where there's hurt, in places where there's sickness, oh Lord, we speak the name that heals. We speak the name that saves. We speak the name that brings life. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, we thank you, Jesus.
sin and darkness over every enemy. Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Let's proclaim the name of Jesus, whatever situations you have. Shout, Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the street. Every circumstance is Jesus in the name of all nations. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Church, let's sing this song again. Let's sing this song. Let's shout Jesus. Let's shout Jesus the streets. Let's shout Jesus over our family. Let's shout Jesus over diseases, illnesses. Let's shout Jesus over our nation, over the political sphere. Let's shout Jesus over the church and Jesus over the community so that the darkness will go because we shout Jesus, the name of Jesus. Can we do that? Let's sing the song again. Shout, shout Jesus, Jesus from the mountain. Shout, shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the
before the Lord and says, we want to know you more. To Jesus, say, I really want to know you more. And I surrender it all. It is through surrendering ourselves, every part of being, surrendered life that we will know Jesus more. Let's sing that song again. Let's cry it out from the depth of our being, our heart, and say, we surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender our deeds, our entire being surrendered unto you. Father, when we look at the things around us today, Lord, there are so many uncertainties from the pandemic to the political situation to the economy to everything else to even doing church. Everything is so uncertain. But Lord, we know in you there is certainty. Hallelujah. In you there is certainty because the Jesus of yesterday, today and forever will be the same. Is the same. There is such a certainty is upon the rock of Jesus that never changes. And we praise God that even in spite of a changing world, you never change. Father, our hope is anchored upon a never changing Jesus. And our confidence is always on a never changing God that we have known. Thank you, Lord. And in all these things, we say, Lord, to understand, to be anchored unto a never changing Jesus is to live the surrendered life the surrendered life to the never-changing Jesus. Father, 
thank you again that we can look to you that the world faces uncertainty and, and they are stressed but Lord your church will not be stressed because Lord we look to you we look not to men we look not to systems we look not to um, science and medicine but we look to you Lord in all these things Lord we know when we are helpless this is where your glory manifests itself when we know Lord that there's nothing much anything else that we can do this is where you will come through for us where we are bowed before you and knelt before you and says Lord we are helpless we are surrendered it all this is where you are strong we will make us strong we are strong in you because Lord this is where you can work in us where we know that we are not clever enough we are never good enough we do not know what to do no more ideas this is where we are good enough because you will come true for us because Lord we know apart from you we cannot do anything but it is only in you thank you Lord I pray that in this season your church and your believers will shine even brighter in the midst of all this your church will shine bright in a world that is in darkness and getting darker but lord your church gets brighter the light of jesus burns ever brighter through your people in the church out into the community into the state into the nation and the nations beyond father we thank you again that it is all about you at all time anchored upon the never changing Jesus and Lord this is where we are living a surrender life thank you Lord all this in Jesus name Amen Amen Hallelujah please be seated thank you thank you I want to pass this time over to uh, Wayward for to give us our GBC news come Wayward yes. good morning everyone Wow, um, it's, it's an absolute privilege to be standing here and seeing familiar faces. Um, let's, let's give each other a wave and, and give yourselves a clap as well. And praise, praise our God. It's, it's an absolute privilege to be here. Um, right, good morning everyone. My name is Wei Wen. I'm here to bring you the GBC News today. Um, we would like to welcome newcomers, whether you are here with us or online. Please give us a wave, if we have any today. Okay, no problem. Right, if you are joining here with us online for the first time, um, we have a team of members who would love to welcome you. Please give us a wave. We would like to acknowledge you as well. Okay, may I have the slides, please? Right, um, GBC is online. Our videos on our, for our weekly service is on YouTube as well. So feel free to follow us on our social media channels and YouTube as well. Next, please. Wednesday prayer meeting will happen as usual on Zoom. Please set, a type, uh, please set your time aside, especially for this meeting as we come together and pray. As, as Pastor mentioned before, in all times we pray, we pray and we pray. When it's not enough, we continue to pray more. Amen? Okay, next please. Right, okay. Alpha is a course where we come together and we have conversations and we have discussions and talk about um, questions about life, about spirituality. So Converge will be happening on 21st of August, on Friday, 8.30. Do invite your friends, um, your colleagues, your family as we explore more questions together. I'm sure every one of us, we, we have questions and we, want to want, and we want to know how can we make the best, not just the most, but the best of the rest of our lives. So um, do snapshot this, invite your friends. If you have any questions, if you want to know more, keep it, um, you can contact Jo Ching. Thank you, next. Okay, um, tithes and offering. Um, we, we trust that this is a difficult time, but the Lord seeks our heart more importantly above else. Um, let's, let's worship Him through our tithes and offering as well. We encourage um, tithes and offerings to be done, transferred online. However, um, over here in the front, we have a box. If you would like to make the tithes and offering through cash or check, you can do so after the service right in front over here. Thank you, everyone. God bless you and have a great weekend. We'll pass the time next to Pastor Mock. Thank you. Good morning.
morning. Good to see all of you. Come, let's pray together before we begin. Thank you, Lord. Lord, your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, we pray, Lord, that as we sit under your word today, Lord, indeed, it will pierce, it will penetrate our hearts, O God. Lord, to discern all the thoughts and intents of our hearts so that we may be changed to conform to the image of your Son. And in his name we pray. Amen. You know, children ask a million questions, right? For those of us who have young who are, or who had young children before, three, four years old, they will always ask, why? Why, mommy, do you have to go to work? Why, daddy, do you have to go to work? Why is the sky blue? Why does the ice cream melt, you know? And after you've answered, they will ask, why? Again, they ask a million questions, why? And as adults, we also ask, why? But what happens when God asks, why? Children ask, why? Because they want to explore and, and make sense of the world. But what about God? When God asks, why? Does God ask why? Yes, he does. And God asks why not so that he may make sense of the world, but so that we can make the right sense of all that we do. And for some of us today, today especially these days, uh, we may, with everything that is you know, disrupted and changed and new normals and so on, we may ask, you know, what, where's, where's all this leading to? You know, what, what value does what I do have? And we start to question again and look, re-examine all that we do. And how does it all fit together? Where does all this lead to? And today as we look at Zechariah 7, I, hope, I trust that uh, we will get some pointers and some answers to these questions. So let's turn to Zechariah chapter 7, verse 1. We continue today on our series in Zechariah. So chapter 7, verse 1. It says, in the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, the month of Kislev. The people of Bethel had sent Shariza and Regemmelek together with their men to entreat the Lord by asking the priests of the house of the Lord Almighty and the prophets, should I mourn and fast in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? Then the word of the Lord Almighty came to me, Ask all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? And when you were eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourselves? Are these not the words the Lord proclaimed through the earlier prophets when Jerusalem and its surrounding towns were at rest and prosperous? And then the Negev and the western foothills were settled. We paused there for a while. You know, at this point, it's been two years since the eight night visions. Huh? You know, Pastor Yan Huat preached last week on the eight vision, the four chariots. And after that, it's been about two years already, you know, to this point. And that at this point, after two years, the temple is being rebuilt it will take another three years or so before it is completed. But it's been two years and the temple is being rebuilt. So you can see something taking shape, taking form already. The, te the foundation has already been laid and there's something going on. There's something is being rebuilt. You can see the shape. And one day, this small contingent arrives in Jerusalem, near the temple. They're looking for the priests and the prophets. And they are led by two men who had Babylonian names. And it would seem that this, this small contingent were Jews from, from Babylon because these two men had Babylonian names. And they have come to meet God's priests and prophets and to really ask one question. Just ask one question. It says, you no, know, for many years, almost 70 years actually, we have fasted in the fifth month. Year after year, 70 years, in this fifth month, we fast. Fast to commemorate and to really mourn for the burning of the temple, the destruction of the temple. That's what the fast was for, to commemorate the destruction, the burning down of the temple. 
But, you know, we heard and now we actually see that the temple is being rebuilt. Oh, wow, praise God. And since it is being rebuilt, you know, should we continue to mourn and fast? You know, although we have done it for so many years, should we continue? Should we continue to mourn and fast? It's being rebuilt. What do you think? Makes sense, isn't it? Huh? Makes sense? Yes? No? Don't know? Yeah. <laughs> and God heard that question. And he answered in two parts. First thing, part one, he said, when you fasted and mourned, in the fifth and actually three other fasts, they instituted three other fasts, so actually all four fasts. When you fasted in the, and mourned in the fifth and the seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? Was it really for me? And when you were eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourselves? So what is God really saying? These are rhetorical questions. Uh, these people would have heard you know, Zechariah speaking on, behalf, on God's behalf. Was it really for me? And no, they would have to answer, not really. It wasn't really. You know, when they fasted, it wasn't really for God. When you were feasting, not fasting, when you were feasting, weren't you feasting for yourselves? And the answer, their answer would be, yes, they were feasting for themselves. So whether fasting or feasting, actually, they didn't have God in mind. It was all self-centered. It was all self-pity, self-centered. So they were not fasting with genuine sorrow and repentance at the burning of the temple at the idolatry and the wickedness that led to the burning of the temple, the destruction of that temple. They were not repenting, they were not sorrowing for the reasons that led to the burning of the temple. Was it really for me? No. So the fast may have started with good intentions, you know, after the burning of the temple, 70 years, you know, they were spent in Babylon. Although the fast be began with good intention, it has become ritual. It has become formality. It has become just tradition, just another thing to observe, just another tradition to observe. So that's why it wasn't really for God. There is no contrition, no repentance from the heart. The heart was not really involved. There was no repentance, no contrition of heart because of what caused the temple to be burned in the first place. So it was all out of self-centeredness, out of self-pity that they continued to observe this fast. Just like when they were feasting, it was all about themselves. Nothing about God. So, you know, when times are better, you know, the temple is being rebuilt, once again, they want to kind of unburden themselves, uh, unburden themselves of this fast, unburden themselves of God. And when you really think about it, you know, if, if the fast really led them to be repentant, to humble themselves, to be dependent on God, why would you want to stop something that leads you to be repentant, to humble yourself, to be dependent on God? Why would you want to stop that? So, why do you do what you do? Is it really for me? Ask God. And this question, is it really for me? Is needed, no, for us even today. Is it really for me? So this is the first part of God's answer. And this is how we can apply it to ourselves today. If we profess to be Christians, our Christianity must be real and relational, relational in terms of relation to God. If we are Christians, if we profess to be Christians, then our Christianity must be real, must be relational, not just ritual 
formality and tradition in all that we do, no matter what we do. Real meaning genuine, sincere, living, substantial, honest, thorough. It must be real. It cannot be just hollow and skin deep, superficial pretense and for mere show, just a show. It must not be that. It must be real. It must be relational, not a show. Not ritual, not tradition, not formality, not for show, not pretense, not skin deep, not superficial. That is not Christianity. That's not what God is looking for, and we better know it today. And this is serious. This is a serious matter. Why do I say it's serious? Because Jesus himself talked about this. Not just in Zechariah. Jesus himself talked about, talks about this. And he talks about it in two, well, at least in two different ways. Uh. And Jesus took this very seriously. It matters deeply to him. Why? Because he reserved his most severe rebuke to the scribes and the Pharisees. What did he call them? He called them hypocrites, serpents, a generation of vipers. He called them whitewashed tombs. Why? Because their religion was only outward. There is no inward substance. That's why it's important. And Jesus received the, mo reserved the most severe rebuke you know, for this group of people. Another way that we can see that this mattered greatly to Jesus was because when Jesus told his parables, and there were many parables, and his parables strongly contrasted the true disciples and those who were, well, nominal or fake disciples. What parables? Actually, quite a few parables. Parable of the sower, you would remember. Parable of the sower shows the true disciples and those who fall away. Parable of the wheat and the tares, parable of the two sons, parable of the ten virgins, those who had oil and those who did not have oil. Parable of the great supper, those who responded and those who did not respond. This is a serious matter to Jesus. So there's a, all these parables really to show the difference between real and fake religion. That there is really a danger and the uselessness of fake religion. That in the end, you know, fake religion is worthless, no use. In the scriptures, also the, our Bible points out that there can be fake spiritual activity. Did you know that? Do you know that there can be fake repentance or not? There can be fake repentance, for example, King Ahab, for example, King Saul, for example, Judas Iscariot, fake Repentance. Do you know that there can be fake humility? Colossians chapter 2, verse 23 says there are things and there are people that have an appearance of wisdom, but false humility. These are not my words, you know. These are words from the Bible. False humility. Can there be fake praying or not? Fake prayer. Can there be or not? There is too. Mark chapter 12, verse 40. And this is Jesus saying, you know, there are people who, for a show, make lengthy prayers. Was he talking about long prayers and short prayers? No. He was talking about, for a show, make lengthy prayers. So there can be fake prayers as well. Can there be fake worship or not? Praise? Words, adoration, singing maybe, can that be fake worship or not? Yes. Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. Jesus again. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. There can be fake worship. What about fake faith? Can that be fake faith? And the answer is yes too. In Acts chapter 8, you read about Simon Magus, 
this person who said that he believed, but actually God found that he, God found I mean, his life was not right. His faith was not right in God's sight. So this is a serious matter. Whether we are our Christianity, our religion, our faith is real, it's relational, or whether it's just ritual and formality and tradition. So now, as a church and as individuals, we also observe many traditions and many practices. And today I want us to examine again, assess again, these things that we do, these things that we observe, just that question, is it really for me? For example, we observe the, today, these days, we observe the NECF 40-day fast and prayer. And we must ask ourselves, is it really for me? Is it really for me? Or is it just for show? Is it just to, tell, to be able to tell people, yeah, 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 I'm in the program. I read it every day, you know. I, I'm in the program. I'm on board. Is it merely for that? Or is God the focus of that 40 day of fast and prayer? Wednesday prayer meeting. We have observed this for years, you know. Every Wednesday now. Do we hold it because we want to focus on God? Or is it just another program? Those of us who join it, is it because we want to really pray? Is it really for me? Or do we just want to show our face there? So that people can know that, yeah, no, yeah, he was there, she was there. What is it really for? But no, not, not just this, huh? our own personal prayer, our own personal worship, our own personal Bible reading, all that, you know, uh, journaling, whatever it is. We must ask that question. I mean, we must hear God asking that question today. Is it really for me? Or has it all become just tradition, just ritual, just formality? Yes, I tick this box and it makes me feel good. Is it really for me? No, why are we here today? Or why are we you know, online today? We may say that we are here to worship God and that is right and that is true, I hope. But then it could also be that we want to look, just look, uh, just look great, look good to other people, that we are moral people. It could be that we want to be in, we want to belong, we want to win people's approval, we want to win people's uh, admiration, that's also possible. We want to tick a checkbox, that's also possible. Why? Why do we do what we do? Is it really for me? And you can tell, you know, whether your heart is really in it or not. How do you tell whether your heart is in it or not? If your heart is not in it, you will just tolerate it. Tahan. Tolerate it. It gives you no pleasure, no delight. Ayo, my turn again. Ayo, Wednesday again. Sunday again. Ayo, you know. How come it doesn't end earlier, you know? How come I keep talking and talking and talking? <laughs> I just want to tolerate it. Uh. And you feel like, you know, you can't wait for it to be over. You take no pleasure in it. But we cannot fall into the other extreme, okay? Let me say that again. Uh. We cannot fall into the other extreme to just give up and abandon uh, Every, every tradition and every form. There's this Anglican bishop who lived in the 1800s, actually, who said, uh, J.C. Rao, he said this, he said, do not suppose that forms of religion are of no use at all. The misuse of a thing is no argument against the right use of it. So it's not that we want to abandon and throw off every ritual and every tradition. They have its place. They have their place. You know, they, they instill discipline, the rigor, you know, instill the, 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 the discipline in us 
So, you know, for example, you know, if a child, if you ask a child to brush his teeth and he says, no, not today, you know, I'm just lazy, I don't want, and from day to day I'm lazy, I don't want, you know, that you still want this child to brush his teeth, you want to instill that discipline. And sometimes the ritual and traditions help to do that. So there is a place for that. I'm not saying that you throw off everything. But it cannot be merely ritual and tradition. For us, our Christianity must have that heart in it. It must be real. It must be relational. Sometimes, you know, we, we fumble, we stumble, we sputter, you know. But whether our Christianity is weak or feeble, I mean, our Christianity can be weak, can be feeble, but it must still be real. It must be still be real to God. It must still be relational. Never let anything become just ritual, just form, just I just do. Because my cell group leaders say I must do. My cell group leaders say I must appear in cell group. No point. It's not, it's not real. When we are here, when we are online, it must be real. It must be real worship. No point in coming here and no just going through my WhatsApp message, you know, as the worship is on or, you know, play games or, or whatever. No point. It must be real. Is it really for me? You know, so many years ago, I was in Sarawak and going to the long houses, this short mission trip. And you know, like so many others uh, who go to these kind of mission trips, you know, we, we see the, the, the simplicity of life. How much we have here, actually, and they don't. And yet, uh, they worship the singing. and Wow, it's so heartfelt. You can feel it, you know. And, we, and here, you know, we are so sophisticated. We have so much going for us. Is it real? All that we do, I remember this, there was this night that was raining, you know, and, and these people in Sarawak, they, they, I don't know how long they must have traveled, an hour at least in the rain, just to get to the meeting. Amazing. And they, and they go there, they don't moan and groan, no. Well, you, you can feel, see their, their faces eager, you know, enthusiastic. Fantastic. Must be real, must be relational. All that we do, all that we do. Part two starts from verse eight. And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty said, administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor, do not plot evil against each other. But they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly, they turned their backs and covered their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by His Spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. When I called, they did not listen. So when they called, I would not listen, says the Lord Almighty. I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations where they were strangers. The land they left behind was so desolate that no one traveled through it. This is how they made the pleasant land desolate. Let me paraphrase that. The prophet is saying, Zechariah is saying, this is what God said before. Not that he's saying it just now, okay? This is what the prophet, this is what God said before, God said, administer justice, show mercy, show compassion to one another. And this is God's heart. This is the heart of the law. If you sum up the whole law, what does it say? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. This is the heart of God's law. This is God's heart already. And God says, you know, this is my heart. Share my heart. But what did they do? They willfully disobeyed. Willfully, they stubbornly disobeyed. They did not pay attention. They turned their backs and covered their ears. Like this. Uh. If you talk to your child and your child does that to you, will you be angry or not? Of course. 
God was very angry. They turned their backs, covered their ears. God was very angry, and that's why they suffered God's punishment. Because they willfully disobeyed. God scattered them into exile. And this was for the, for the generation before. and made the, their land, Palestinian land, a wasteland. The point is, don't disobey like them. Don't disobey like them. Obey the Lord. Be devoted to Him. Not just obey the law, the, the rules, the regulations, but obey God, the person. Be devoted to God, the person. Share His heart. Become like Him. Express his heart in kindness, in justice, not criminal justice, social justice and kindness, how we treat people. Show that, express that. That is finally, ultimately, that is what matters to God, you know. You remember this phrase huh, that we know so well, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience to God. God is not saying here, I replace one set of laws with another set of laws. No. He says your heart must be in this, and this is the heart of the law. If you follow all the religious stuff, you know, actually, ultimately, it will lead to this, ultimately. So if you don't see this, hey, something is wrong. Jesus said this too. What sorrow Matthew 23, 23. What sorrow awaits you, teachers and religious law, of the teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites! For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law. What are they? Justice, mercy, faith. The weightier matters of the law you have neglected. Jesus is concerned about that too. And this is not new, you know. 200 years before Zechariah, the prophet Isaiah said the same thing. And you can find this in Isaiah chapter 1 itself, verses 10 to 17. He says, The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, sabbaths, convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Who asked for these sacrifices? Who asked for these ceremonies? God. But why was he so offended at these things that the people offer? Because they missed the point of the law. They missed the point of all these rituals and ceremonies. And that is to love and to treat the fellow men rightly. Not to bully, not to oppress. The rituals are not an end in themselves. The rituals and the, the ceremonies lead to God. And from God, His love and how he, His kindness should be expressed through us, to the people, to others to love God and to love people, and they have disobeyed that. You fast forward from the time of Isaiah a thousand years, and you see in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 to 29, there's a person, is not a Jew, who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. 
So the message from many thousand years ago, even to now, and to Romans and to now, the message is still the same. You and I, we are the people of God. Not because of external rules that we perform, that we follow, but because of a heart transformation by the Spirit of God. For us to have this heart transformation, a heart that obeys God's heart. A heart that obeys God's heart. A heart that is fashioned after God's own heart. That is what changes us. I was watching YouTube and I came across this clip. It was a clip in China, social experiment, social experiment on human kindness. When you think about China, or when I thought about China, one of the people are very self-centered, uh, very selfish, very high and mighty, don't care about others, very individualistic. But there was this clip uh, that shows human kindness, social experiment. So there was this little boy, nine years old, and he carried a small little box of coins. And it was his mother's birthday. I, I'm sure he was an actor, la, but because it was a social experiment. La. And he went from, from shop to shop, florist. And he would tell the shop, shop owner, hey, today is my mother's birthday. You know, this, this is all the money I have. What flowers can I get for this? And, and the shop, so many shopkeepers, you know, just gave him flowers because it was his mother's birthday. Uh, what, what do you want to say? I remember one, one, of, one of the shopkeepers, this lady, says, Ai song gaini, puyong chen. So many shopkeepers did that. There was another, another, another social experiment. This, uh, this man, you know, he was, he was eating, this old man in a public place, he was eating, but his hands were trembling, you know. So he, he couldn't eat properly, he couldn't eat well, everything was falling away falling out. And you can see strangers, strangers going and just helping him to eat, feeding him. Amazing, I thought. There was another one. This, at a bus stop, and this, uh, you know, many people there, and this, this lady, young lady, dressed nicely, and along came this migrant worker, shabbily dressed, maybe smelly, kind of dirty looking. And this nice, nice dressed lady would scold him, you know, berate him. Lah. No, you're so smelly, you're so dirty, why come here? You know, you should go to another place. Blah, blah, blah. And people around there would stand up for this migrant worker. Justice, mercy, compassion, kindness. All that we do, the prayers, the Bible study, coming to church, fellowship, cell group, all that we do, I think should converge into that. Nah. True or not? I just, there's this Christian brother who just passed away. And yeah, he was a doctor. And I just heard his sister say yesterday that you know, when he was practicing, when the poor came in, he would charge minimum. He would charge five ringgit. These days, you know, five ringgit. A doctor charging five ringgit for consultation, just to cover some of the medicine. I'm not saying that all the doctors should charge five ringgit, okay? <laughs> but when the poor came in, the sister said he would just charge five ringgit. And when she herself went to see her brother, you know, the clinic, she, she would tell the brother, Hey, this one, uh, company's expenses. You don't have to charge. You, you can charge more. It's okay. But the brother will say, no, no. I just charge what is fair, what, what, what is enough. I, again, I think, you know, all our religion, all our Christianity should finally come down to that. Justice, mercy, compassion, kindness. If it doesn't transform us, if our religion, if all that we do is just formality and ritual and tradition and it doesn't finally funnel down into that, I think we've got to relook really at our own religion, at how we live our faith. Is it 
real? Is it relational? So, once again, our Christianity must be real and relational, not just ritual, formality, tradition. Remember, formal religion, just outward religion, superficial religion, is worthless before God. And Jesus made it so clear. God desires our obedience, our devotion, not to another set of rules, but to Him, the person, to His heart. And finally expressed, finally expressed through justice, social justice, that we don't bully, that we don't oppress, but we help the weak and the vulnerable, the poor, the needy, that we are kind. And this is our goal. The Spirit is our power to do that. As long as our faith rests in Jesus Christ. You know, this pandemic has really stripped us of a lot of things that we took for granted. Of the forms and the, and the structures and the programs even in church. You know, we don't have to be in church. We can watch online, and in doing so, we don't, I heard somebody say, don't have to wake up early, don't have to dress up. There are less gatherings in church, no need to host visitor lunch for the cell groups. Are you happy? <laughs> Did you do it really for me? And you are, if you're online, you can turn off the video, put your feet up, Enjoy coffee. Again, multitask on a few things. Is it really for me? So, is it really for me or is it really for yourself what you do? Is it really just for yourself? Why? Why do you do what you have done before? Why? Do you do what you are doing? That's the question we must ask ourselves today. And I, I, I believe uh, that's the question that God asks us today. It's really, you know, many things have changed. Maybe, you know, again, we need to change the way that we do things too. But always remember, is it real? Is it relational in the end? Amen. Can I invite the worship team? Come, let's stand together. I want us to take some time just to reflect. No point if it's just words that you no know, brush by the ear and you no, know, we go home and nothing changes. You fast, you pray, you read your Bible, you worship. You give your time, ministry, talent. In the end, is it ready for me? Or is it just all a show? Spend your time. Let's each one of us ask ourselves that question. we claim Jesus as our Savior, our Lord, then we must know that He has done everything, everything that's needed to bring us to God. There's nothing, nothing for us to do anymore. There is nothing for us to prove to God or to one another. There's nothing to prove.
But Lord, even as we are honest, Lord, we say, we confess there are times, oh God, Lord, we do it for those very reasons that we want to call attention to ourselves. We want to win admiration. We want people's approval. We want to belong. It was really for ourselves and not for you. So Lord, even though we are weak and feeble, and we stumble and we fall, we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, that even as we confess, Lord, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin. So help us, God, in all that we do to be real, to be genuine, to be relational to you, O oh God. And in that, Father God, Lord, to grow deeper, to grow intimate, Father, with you, to know you, to be like your son. Lord, that's our desire. And may that, Father God, be our joy as well. Bless your people, O oh God, here, online, O oh God. Let every encounter, every meeting with you be real, Father God, Lord, and be edifying. Thank you, Lord, once again for your grace, mercy toward us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.